Member of Parliament, Rosemary Falk, thank you so much for being with me today. Yeah, no problem. You know, you are millennial, mm -hmm. you're a woman, you're like all the optics of what all the political parties are going after right now. So talk to us a little bit about your story. What, what motivated you to run? Sure, so I'm actually a social worker uh, by profession. Uh, when I finished uh, my social work degree, the conversation of physician-assisted suicide was happening. Hmm. Uh, this would have been before the 2015 election, uh, before Stephen Harper's loss. And um, I was practicing medical social work, so in the, in the hospital setting, and seeing how it affects real families. Right, and in the social work world, we have different terminologies of a micro or a meso or a macro, and this is this was a great opportunity to affect policy on a macro level, uh, as opposed to just the the local level, and you know help cut red tape, which is anybody that works on the front lines' worst nightmare. Wow. Yeah. And so Jerry Ritz, he was a cabinet minister yeah. at the time, just out of the blue, decided yeah. to step down. By election gets called, yeah. and you're like, you're in your late twenties at the yep. time. You're like. I'm just gonna give this a shot. Yep. Tell us about that. You know, and it's funny because people mention, like, you know, Jerry Ritz was a cabinet minister. I had no idea. Like, I knew he was, but it didn't intimidate me. I just knew uh, I need to put my name on a ballot, and I have a great husband, a supportive family. Uh, my mom would go door knocking with me during the nomination, and we cold knocked doors and sold memberships, and that's that's what we did. Wow. Yeah, and there was no, there was never a doubt. There was never a, uh, Oh, well, you shouldn't be doing this because you're a woman. Oh, well, it's going to be hard. There was none of that. It was, no, this is what I'm going to do, and my husband's here to support me, and we did it. So you're young, you're a woman, but you're also, I'm going to throw you in the hot seat here for yeah. a second, pro-life. Absolutely. And I remember there being pressure on you during the election by, by some people to sort of dumb that down, but for you sure. didn't. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's actually funny when you look back at um, the nomination race. It was me and four other men. Uh, all, for the most part, all older than me. And uh, I was the first one to speak the first night we had our first meeting. And I said, I am pro-life and I will not deny that. And it actually set the tone. Uh, all of a sudden I was running against everybody that was pro-life. And uh, I think it's really important that uh, you, one owns their values uh, and not be ashamed or afraid to, to say what they believe and, and what they are. Wow. Yeah. Well, you definitely are not afraid to say what you think or what you mean. And so what we're going to do right now is we're actually going to watch a clip of you in action in Parliament. And this is actually a montage of several different statements that you've made about several different issues uh, over about the last year. And then we're going to pick up the conversation about where you see things going in Parliament uh, after we watch this clip. Wonderful. So. Mr. Speaker, tackling climate change requires leadership. Canada continues to fall further and further behind its emissions targets. And the Prime Minister's personal choices, like flying between Ottawa and Florida, four times in three days, are not helping. In fact, his carbon footprint is insulting to Canadians who are already struggling to get ahead and who have to pay the Liberal carbon tax just to drive to work. The reality is Canada will not meet the Paris emissions targets under this Prime Minister. That is because the Liberal carbon tax is not an environmental plan, it is a tax plan. And it's a tax plan that punishes Canadians living in rural Canada. Government documents reveal that the Liberals have a plan to hike their carbon tax 15 times higher than it is today. That's an annual $5,000 carbon tax for all Canadian families, including those families that are struggling, unlike what the Prime Minister just stated earlier. Well, that may be peanuts for the Prime Minister, who inherited a great family fortune. The average Canadian cannot afford it. Why is the Prime Minister covering up the actual cost of his carbon tax until after the election? Mr. Speaker, China continues to block canola imports due to baseless claims. For two months, our canola producers have been waiting for this Prime Minister to show some leadership and to stand up for their interests. Instead, the Prime Minister has let China walk all over him. Our canola producers are being penalized. When will the Prime Minister stand up to China and defend Canadian producers? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, keeping Canadians safe should be the priority of every government, and a serious crime should never be taken lightly. Yet the Liberals are pushing ahead with legislation to reduce sentencing for serious crimes. Human trafficking is a despicable crime with a devastating impact on its victims. It is a crime that is growing in Canada. We need to be sending a clear message to perpetrators. Modern day slavery is unacceptable in our communities and carries a severe penalty. 
Instead, through C-75, the Liberals are eliminating consecutive sentences for human traffickers. Canadians are right to be concerned. Their misguided legislation could result in lighter sentencing for a long list of serious crimes. I know uh, as being a young woman, sometimes uh, it's difficult to know when is the right time to speak and, and not to be discouraged by the, the louder voices that don't want me to speak. So I want to thank you for your courage and, um, and for coming here. Wow. So that's <laughs> Rosemary in action. Yeah. I, I want to say beast mode. <laughs> Don't mess with the you Ukrainian. You touched a lot of topics. Uh, yes, well, you've done a lot of work, right? This is amazing. Yeah. Now, I want to mention for those that might not be familiar with the House of Commons. So you're part of the official opposition. Mm -hmm. And so your job is to hold uh, Justin Trudeau's feet to the fire yeah. on a variety of issues and question yeah. and challenge. That's kind of what you're doing there yeah, exactly. in all those various clips. But yeah, covered a ton of ground. Mm -hmm. uh, in those clips, are, are there any particular topics that are really burning in your heart and that you feel are going to be significant uh, in the next few months here in Parliament? Well, I think when we look at uh, what's going on right now in Alberta and Saskatchewan, especially uh, just with Wexit and the pipeline and oil and gas and just our economy, economy out there uh, and I and I say this all the time you know I, I support and I'm there to be a voice for families taxpayers and and uh, farmers mm -hmm. and a lot of our farmers subsidize their farming with oil and gas work mm -hmm. so it's this intertwined uh, layer after layer that complements one another so they work on the farms in the summer Absolutely. and on the rigs in the winter. Yeah, or hauling survive. oil or hauling water, that type of thing, trucking. Uh, and that's what they use, that's the money they use to keep their their farm afloat. Uh, so, you and know. these are farms that feed absolutely, Canadians. Absolutely, absolutely. Saskatchewan uh, feeds the world, right? Our grain, our cattle, uh, you know, they, they go out and literally feed the world, these people in Saskatchewan. And so I think uh, once the House reconvenes, uh, it'll be really interesting to see what, in, in Justin Trudeau's throne speech, what he makes an importance. And I think that's going to kind of dictate where we're going to go in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, you live Lloydminster, yep. uh, Battlefords. That's your, yep. your constituency. How are you seeing what's happening in the prairies? How are you seeing it impact families in your, your riding? Uh, well, the day after the election, uh, there was an oil company that's very prominent in Lloydminster, laid off about 60 people. And so, you know, these people coming into work and seeing taxis lined up, not knowing that those taxis are actually going to take them home, you know, a couple hours later after they have a conversation. And uh, I was telling people the other day, I said, what's so important to recognize about this is it isn't just a job. This is, you know, money that uh, puts the kids in hockey. This is the money that puts uh, kids in dance or food on the table. And uh, I don't see what the federal government is doing to make that a priority uh, for these families, like their job security. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. and uh, anything else that's kind of on your radar? How about freedom of conscience? For issues, sure, absolutely. Uh, I'm in a really unique position because I live in Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, which is the border city of Canada. We're half Alberta, half Saskatchewan. So I've been following uh, what's going on in Alberta right now with their conscience rights bill. And uh, for me, I see it as a no-brainer that we need to protect uh, those uh, physicians, uh, nurses, healthcare practitioners, institutions that don't want to participate due to their conscience. Uh, physician assisted suicide and uh, you know I think that's should be front and foremost in, in conversations with people because once we start start to take away that that right to think that right to believe that right uh, of speech we're gonna go down a very scary scary path as a nation Wow. Mm -hmm. So let's keep that on our radar. Now, in yes. the last parliament, there was a private member's bill, not a government bill, but a private member's yes. bill that came forward federally on the physician conscience right. rights. Um, if your number gets pulled, do you have any ideas of what you might put forward as a private member's bill? I have. There's there's a list in my mind. Um, I'm, I'm getting excited because that's going to come very soon. And I expect to be pulled near the front. I mean, I couldn't even say what I would do. I mean, conscience rights, yes. Uh, protection for unborn, absolutely. Uh, it just kind of depends where I get pulled. Do you think your leader will let you put something forward? Uh, my, that's a very good question. My leader has stood beside uh, and behind his comments of allowing backbenchers hmm. to uh, bring forward 
legislation. I mean, we're not in government as well, which is going to add a little bit of a spice to it. Right. So, yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, I'm going to follow my convictions and um, and the people that I represent. And l let me just qualify that a little bit. When you say follow your convictions, like there was a lot of buzz around Andrew Scheer saying he will not allow an abortion bill. But basically what you're saying is if your number is called as a private member, your leader actually can't stop you Absolutely, from, yeah. like, like technically. No, no leader can stop, stop anybody. Uh, I guess it just depends uh, if, you know, leaders want to use fear tactics and that type of thing. I mean, I've seen it in the last parliament, before I was there with Cassie and Molly's Law, I wasn't mm -hmm. uh, elected at that point, but I had seen, you know, um, even liberals that had a conviction of life that either abstained uh, or voted against, which even, in, even abstaining says, sends a strong message of, of where you stand. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, the entire Conservative Caucus um, sat down on a particular motion mm -hmm. back in May. We're gonna talk about that in a second and it relates to women, mm -hmm. young women. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about that right after this clip by Jordan Peterson where he's unpacking the whole ideology around gender equity and the cabinet. So let's watch this clip uh, right after the break and then pick up the conversation. For sure. That's right after this.